everybody. Um, I was just at the lighthouse in Trinidad. There's it's the hundredth and fiftieth anniversary of Trinidad Lighthouse. It's the only operable lighthouse still, you know, in Humboldt County. Uh, the BLM manages that lighthouse, the ground beneath it. The Coast Guard man actually manages the light. And uh, so we had several participants out there. And um, right now, I'm just so glad to be warm and so glad to share this journey with you about the book. And um, before I forget, I just want to add that um, tonight's Arts Alive, and I'm going to be at Book Lager. Um, and they are selling this book, Lighthouses of Humboldt County. And this is what it looks like. And I'm gonna be signing books there from six to eight. So if you get a chance, um, please come out and meet me in person. And um, it's supposed to be a really wonderful night with all the December lights and, you know, just a Christmas themed Arts Alive. It's always really fun, um, especially with all the local gifts that, that we can buy for each other. Okay, with that, I'm gonna share my screen. And hopefully everyone can see this. So if you can't, please let us know. So I decided to write this. Oh, um, Kelly, we can't see your screen. Oh, you can't? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see here. But it's not allowing me to. Um, is there advanced? Well, am I a host? Do I say who, who can share? Here, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and make you the host. So you now have all the power. Okay. <laughs> so you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. There we go. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that, great. Okay, so what you guys are seeing right there is um, a picture of the Trinidad Lighthouse. So if you haven't been there before, it's up on Trinidad Head and there's the Harrington family with Fred Harrington, his wife Josephine, who I actually play in living history presentations and Fred Jr. and Maude. And they were there for 28 years from 1888 to 1916. The California Coastal National Monument was established in two, the year 2000 by President Clinton. It has 20,000 rocks and islands along it. Um, it's uh, almost 8,000 acres. So it's managed for all the wildlife habitat on there, as well as, um, you know, just the, the wild, um, rocks and islands and the pinnacles along the coastline. So most famously is the Trinidad Head, which is a gateway. Um, and then we have the um, Lighthouse Ranch, which, which used to be Table Bluff. Las Coast Headlands, which is a little further south of Table Bluff. Point Arena. And then the uh, Cotoni Coast uh, Dairies, which is near Santa Cruz. And Pedro Lancas, which is a lighthouse in San Luis Obispo um, near San Simeon. And those are all gateways to the California Coastal National Monument managed by the Bureau of Land Management. So uh, just a quick little uh, sort of um, background into our lighthouses. So we've had five lighthouses in Humboldt County. The first one is um, on the far top left. And that's the Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse, which was built in 1855. Then there was Cape Mendocino, which is the middle picture, and that was 1868. Trinidad Head, 1871. Um, and then Table Bluff, 1892. Uh, Punta Gorda, which is on the King Range National Conservation Area, which you have to hike to. And then we have kind of the most famous lighthouse, I think that everyone recognizes, um, which was recently moved a couple years ago, the Trinidad Memorial Lighthouse. 
and that was built in 1949 and it was never an operable lighthouse it was more of a memorial lighthouse for all the uh, mariners that were lost at sea and all the people that um were um involved in shipping accidents or uh, fishing accidents so that is the rundown of our five lighthouses with the trinidad memorial lighthouse um and you might have heard a lot about the trinidad memorial lighthouse being moved um in 2018 um, it was built by the trinidad civic club in 1949 and um, they are going, it, it is now down by um, Trinidad State Beach, which is near the Seascape restaurant. And um, they will be um, building, they just got money uh, and they're in the planning process of building a base for it to more formalize that space so that when you go visit it, and, and there's a uh, photo there on the right of what that will look like in the future. So, oh, what's going on here? Okay. So we're gonna go by, way back in time to when the Spanish were exploring our area. Uh, they had a trade route from Manila to Acapulco from the 1500s till 1815. And when they went by Humboldt Coast, the Humboldt Coast, they didn't ever see Humboldt Bay. They just saw this solid land strip. Uh, they didn't see the opening of Humboldt Bay at all. And um, it wasn't until the 1700s that they actually uh, ported in Trinidad and um, and they named it Trinidad actually in honor of the Holy Trinity. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then gold was discovered in 1849, 1848, San Francisco. And overnight the population exploded. So it went from a small population to in 1850, um, thousands of people moving to the San Francisco area. And this is what it looked like in 1850, much different from today. And the people that really made the most amount of money, as you might, well, my local historians here, were the merchants. And uh, it wasn't really the gold miners, it was all the merchants selling the supplies to the gold miners. And that idea also spread to our area where the Greg party in 1850 wanted to find an opening to our bay and heard rumors of it and came to um, Humble. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, and um, I wanted to give you a little background. So the native population actually um, that was here um, was the Wiat, And um, this man was a Hoopa tribal member and I talk about him in the book because when he was born, um, he had an interview in 1870. Uh, he um, wrote in his journal um, that when he was born that the um, Greg party had discovered the bay and there was this mixed excitement and wonder and doom all at the same time. And that source came from two people's one place by uh, Freeman House and Ray Raphael. And so he was interviewed in 1870, talking about that tumultuous time when um, you had the meeting of those two very, very different cultures and how they were forever changed after that moment in 1850 uh, when they discovered the bay. So the Greg Barty uh, left uh, Weaverville in November of 1849. They'd heard rumors the, of the opening of the bay they think that their journey will take them 10 days and it takes them 40 days. Um, they almost starved to death. Um, they were almost killed because they actually took salmon from the Native Americans along where 299 is, I believe it was the Yurok. And um, they were able to show some of their beads and trade them so they weren't actually killed <laughs> because, you know, that is uh, an offense, stealing food. 
um, but they were starving and um, were able to um, escape with their lives uh, and um, get down to the area of Mad River where they get into a huge fight. And that's actually how Mad River was named where Josiah Gregg on the left was trying to take measurements of the river and the latitude and the longitude and they just wanted to get going down to the opening of the bay where they could map it out and get on their way to San Francisco to tell their word. And um, Greg wanted to take measurements and um, map it out. And so they got into this huge fight where they almost killed Greg. And that's how the Mad River was named, not because of how it runs madly. Um, it was just the fight that, that they had when they got there. Um, so you'll see in, in this aerial view of Humboldt Bay, you'll see the jetties jetting out. Those are all man-made. Um, so when they entered the bay, there was just those two spits. And you can imagine what the bar was like getting the ships in once they got to San Francisco. Of course, Greg died along the way, fell off his horse, and probably died of salvation, uh, starvation. They actually split up. Um, some went to the east down to San Francisco. Some stayed along the coast. And um, L.K. Wood, of course, comes back along with many others and they settle the bay. Um, just right around Christmas time when they got here, they spent Christmas actually where the Crabs baseball team, um, where the uh, baseball field is. And they um, talked to the Wiat chief Piawata. And this painting is in, the Clark Museum and it was painted by Stephen Shaw and I got permission from them to use that in, in the book as well. So um, interestingly enough, uh, he spoke with the Greg party and they traded and I believe he gave them clams and they were able to go to the area where um, the opening of Humboldt Bay is and they take a dip with their water cup and up, up comes fresh water when they think it's gonna be seawater. And there they are, um, they have found Humboldt Bay and they went on their way. Uh, it, Kilwata, uh, the Wiat chief's daughter, we're gonna talk a little bit about her. Her name is Josephine Beach. She ends up marrying the Trinidad Lighthouse Keeper's daughter. Um, her, her, I'm sorry, her, her son um, ends up marrying the the uh, Trinidad Lighthouse Keeper's um, daughter. So there was this really unique connection. So the Kiwata's daughter was Josephine Beach Kai Quash, and uh, she was Wiat. And um, the only reason why she was able to live the many almost 100 years of her life and escape the Wiat uh, massacre of 1860 was that when she was on her way to the world renewal ceremony on Indian Island, the fog, it was so foggy, just like today, um, a day, it was like a day like today, that her and her son um, sort of got lost as they were canoeing down to the ceremony. And so she returned home. So she's one of the only survivors of that Indian Island massacre. And uh, it was her son that ended up actually marrying the Trinidad Head Lighthouse Keeper's daughter. Just like I said, the jetties weren't built for oh, quite a few years before the uh, the opening of the of the the sort of the commerce and the development of Humboldt Bay and our local area of Eureka and Arcata, which was Union Town at the at the beginning. So there was a many, many shipwrecks that happened. Um, and that was my first chapter in the book, uh, Lighthouses of Humboldt County. A big reason why lighthouses were appropriated during that time. So where do we put a lighthouse? Uh, we had a coastal survey in 1851 and uh, Navy Lieutenant James Alden comes and he looks for an area to put our first lighthouse. He isn't from here. So he decides to put this lighthouse near the jetty um, where the jetties are gonna go through the opening of Humboldt Bay where the bar is. Um, he doesn't realize 
that we have fog 24 seven there. It's in the sand dunes. And where they put the lighthouse is only 50 feet above high, high tide level. So even to see the light is very difficult for mariners. Yeah, but he was hired to, to pick the spot and he said that there wouldn't be any fog there. And then he leaves. And that's exactly where they put the lighthouse out near uh, the um, uh, Samoa uh, Dunes Recreation Area, which if you haven't been out there, you can just drive to the end of Samoa past the cookhouse. And um, there's what's called uh, the Wetland Trail. You can actually see remnants of where our first lighthouse was, the Humboldt Bay. Uh, in 1852, they do a, a formal coastal survey, and you'll see Bucksport, Eureka, and Union. Those are the major towns. And of course, the major commerce is Redwoods, and it kind of switches gears from being that merchant to the gold mines to the Trinities to um, exporting our Redwood for our region. That becomes the major commodity. They put the Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse out in the jetty. Um, and then Bucksport is just right across from the, uh, where the lighthouse is. And you can kind of see it in the background in this painting. So I put an arrow there because it's pretty light, but. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we've had, by 1865, there's 25 wrecks, many, many drownings. 81 people were killed um, while getting just through the Humboldt Bar. It, uh, you know, obviously there's no cars during this period. There's no airplanes, of course. There's no big major mode of transportation from San Francisco to Humboldt. So it's by ship. And um, so a lot of people that were coming in passenger ships um, ended up driving, drowning as well as people in the shipping industry. And most famously, you have the Corona shipwreck, which is in 1907, and then the Milwaukee in 1917, both of which you can see the coffer dam of the Corona near Samoa jetty, and then the Milwaukee out when you're driving out there, you can still see part of the hole when you get out there. Um, another famous shipwreck in our area was the 1860 uh, Northerner, which was a passenger ship from San Francisco. Um, where 38 people drowned. They had actually hit a rock near the um, Cape Mendocino and 108 passengers had to swim to shore um, just outside of Centerville Beach, just west of Ferndale. And there's a cross there commemorating that, but then it was falling down into the ocean. So it was rescued and it's just, I think, sitting by the road when you go out to Las Coast Headlands. So the Lighthouse Board was established in 1852 um, and it was under the Department of Treasury at the time. And the architect was Amy B. Young. And um, so the first lighthouses along the coast of California all looked very similar. They had a tower through the center and then the residents lived below. As you can see in the Battery Point, Point Conception and Alcatraz. And our Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse looked exactly like the one that you see pictured in the Battery Point and then Point Loma as well. And all of those lighthouses combined were budgeted for $136,000. Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse not only had the rough beginning of where it was chosen to be located. This is an old picture I got. Um, so it's, we don't really have any new pictures of what it actually looked like new. So I actually use a lot of the other lighthouses to show um, what it looked like new because it was the same design. So the Oriole that was carrying supplies for um, Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse and another lighthouse up there. For some reason, it, from, it went from San Francisco all the way up to Cape Disappointment and it wrecked in 1853. And all the lighthouse supplies um, for the Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse 
were lost at sea. So they had to start all over again. So I'm telling you, it had rough beginnings. <laughs> Finally, they build it in 1854, but it's only 53 feet above tide. This is a Point Loma lighthouse, but it looked, like I said, exactly like this. The Fresnel lens was built in France and had to be shipped here especially. So I had to come through around the um, Horn of South America, all the way up to San Francisco. And, um, the Lighthouse Board in 1852 required all the lighthouses to be Fresnel lenses and shift from the parabolic reflectors, which you see center, and um, $3,000 per lens. So that's very expensive back then. And um, our Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse light was shipped to Point Loma instead. So the first lighthouse keeper quits in 1854 before he even starts. So finally, in 1856, I think the residents of Humboldt County almost don't even believe it. And the light is lit by John Johnson when he climbs the lighthouse winding stairs and he lights it on December 20th, 1856. And he um, and his wife, Sarah are there and she's got um, five children at the time. Six months later, um, John dies and Sarah becomes the lighthouse keeper, unbeknownst to the lighthouse board. And she's there for about six years. Um, Peg Wheeler's on this, uh, on this call here and she's doing a whole story on Sarah. And she was inspired by the grave that you see on the right. She's memorialized by the Coast Guard every year and she's buried in Myrtle Town Cemetery. She took over the lighthouse keeping after her husband died. And as she's there about six months when they find out the lighthouse board that she's as the lighthouse keeper, they don't fire her, they just reduce her pay by half. And um, she ends up being the, longer, the longest lighthouse keeper at the Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse. It's desolate. It's in the middle of nowhere. She's got to raise five children. Now she does have older children to keep her company. Um, but during that time, there's many lighthouse keepers that are women, um, particularly Ida Lewis, who is down in um, Newport, Rhode Island, who got the Medal of Honor for saving about 11 people from drowning. And she took over the lighthouse keeping from her father and was there from 14 until she retired in her 60s. So lighthouse keeping and, and many of the light, famous lighthouse keepers were women and Sarah Johnson being one of them. And then in 1878, the lighthouse, um, the light saving station, which is now the Coast Guard. Um, this is a drawing of what it looked like. So there was a large hill behind there. Um, that's built in 1878, so no longer does the lighthouse keepers are in the business of saving people. Now they have extra help, and now they can just keep the light on. And then in 1877 and 1882, there's earthquakes that rock the foundation of the Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse and make it weak. Um, so there was work that had to be done. 1884, there's a cyclone. I'm telling you, this place is cursed from the beginning. And that um, really damages the lighthouse out there. And then there's a flood in 1885 and that seals the deal and closes our Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse permanently. And then it stood out there for many, many years until the 1920s and I think the Coast Guard just pushed it down. Um, and then it was, um, a light uh, fog signal st station nearby where the lighthouse was, was built in 1912. Um, and then you have keepers uh, maintaining that as well. So just a few photographs here of what it looked like until it collapsed in the 1920s.
I don't know what's going on here. Let me see. So 1933, it collapses, and you can see the the cupola, which is um, was dug out of the sand, and that's at the Maritime Museum in Samoa. And if you take the wetland trail, you can see remnants of bricks, and you can see these steps, which entered the lighthouse. And if it's hard to see on the right, there was some a big tower that's still in the ground. You can see right where the tower went through. And now it's a big, huge hole, um, but um, it's covered in ivy. So it's really hard to see. And I don't suggest looking for it because it's sort of a dangerous spot. So they decide to move the lighthouse um, to eight. They don't actually move the lighthouse. They just build a new one in 1892. And now we have a lighthouse that is um, on Table Bluff and it's 160 feet, five feet high. And it has a good overlook of the Eel River and um, the Humboldt Bay. So they can see much better. And it's virtually like its own little city. So it's got two homes for the lighthouse keepers. It's got a water tank. They have uh, vegetable gardens. Uh, they raise their own chickens and their own food, and um, it's pretty isolated if you've never been out there. It's now um, also managed by the BLM, and there's a little park out there, um, but I suggest going out there. It's a great spot. And so this is the view from there, Table Bluff Lighthouse, so they would have seen all of Humboldt Bay. Um, to the north and then south to the Eel River. Um, World War II changed a lot for all our lighthouses. Um, the servicemen actually moved into some of the buildings, built buildings out at Table Bluff. Um, so they had the beach patrol uh, after, um, you know, World War II started and Pearl Harbor um, wanted to keep our coast safe. So Table Bluff, and if you've never been out to Samoa, there's bunkers out there that um, still have that evidence of during that time period, as well as um, many structures that were built and actually recently torn down not too long ago that were on the Table Bluff. So um, all the servicemen, a lot of servicemen actually moved to the Table Bluff area. And um, then in uh, the, after that, after the 1940s, um, they automated most of the lighthouses. By 1939, if you weren't a member of the Coast Guard and you were a lighthouse keeper, then you had to be quit. You had to quit um, your position. You, otherwise, you had to enter the Coast Guard. So here is a wonderful photo that's in the book of um, one of the lighthouse keepers that were, was there. And he is receiving reward um, for one of his life-saving efforts. There was a uh, shipwreck before he left out at Table Bluff. He, his wife is standing next to him. Um, he was transferred down to um, San Diego, um, but there was a little bit of a sh uh, private shipwreck, um, just a small boat, um, but he was able to go out there and help the Coast Guard and, and save the people. That, um, and that was in also in the 1940s. Then we have this big transition to Table Bluff, and we have the Gospel Outreach, uh, which was a Christian group that took over, and it was called Lighthouse Ranch for many years. And they actually started the, uh, the Tri-City that you see today. It's not exactly the same thing that you see today, but um, they were entrepreneurs out there. They were in the business of um, making... Um, their own money and being self-sufficient. And they actually also had a lot of vegetable gardens and um, were very off the grid in many respects. And one of their entrepreneur um, measures to keep the gospel outreach alive was, um, like I said, the Tri-City and um, other um, avenues of income. And they were there for quite some time. And there's a lot of great articles in the North Coast Journal about that group. 
of people that were out there. Um, the lighthouse tower at uh, Table Bluff was moved and is now at Woodley Island Marina, which you can see today. It looks much different and uh, much nicer. And uh, while the BLMs managed the Table Bluff Lighthouse, we actually were able to repurpose uh, old growth water tower um, pedestal. Um, and we give to the Page Blancas uh, Lighthouse down in San Simeon. Um, to the right, you see that photo there. And they actually are able to put uh, radio equipment, so um, as well as the lighthouse, the, the uh, water tank as well. So they actually have transmittal equipment that the police and emergency personnel use, sort of like a satellite that they use out of there. But it's disguised as a water tower. In 2012, the BLM removed all the buildings out there that were falling down at the Table Bluff. Um, these were actually military housing during World War II that you see there, those structures. They were full of asbestos, so they had to be really carefully taken down and removed. And now it's a, a wonderful trail to hike out there and beautiful views. And you can see also where that lighthouse was. And there's an interpretive trail there as well. Cape Mendocino Lighthouse was a very interesting place. There were many, many shipwrecks. And I have many stories about that uh, area. They called it the Alcatraz of lighthouses, as well as Punta Gorda. It's where they put a lot of the lighthouse keepers um, that were uh, maybe the rebels of lighthouse keeping during the time, but just to give you an idea where Cape Mendocino Lighthouse was, it's just south of us, sort of in between um, where Punta Gorda Lighthouse and we are. It was on a bluff, so imagine getting all the supplies to the Cape Mendocino folks up that hill from the ocean, so the supply ships and um, the inspector, because the inspector had to come every year. And unfortunately, one year the inspector came and uh, they docked below and he drowned. The ship um, actually wrecked right there at the base. And I thought, who was the lighthouse keeper there? And then from there developed this whole story about a lighthouse keeper named Marble who was a Humboldt Harbor lighthouse keeper. He was a lighthouse keeper here. He had four or five wives. Um, he had a drinking problem. <laughs> and um, he was definitely sent here for a reason. He was actually taken into court because he didn't light the Humboldt Harbor lighthouse a few nights. Um, so he was dragged into court for that. Um, this lighthouse was very isolated. It was very windy. There was some earthquakes at this lighthouse as well. Lighthouse keepers reported running from the lighthouse to their homes during terrific wind storms. So bad that the wind would actually break the windows in their homes. Uh, there was one earthquake that damaged one of the houses so bad that um, they had to live in where they kept the oil in the oil house for the, that would supply the oil of the lamp. And um, their health was so bad when one inspector came that they decided after the 1906 earthquake that there was funding to, keep, to uh, build them a new home. And of course you have the Mendocino Triple Junction right off the coast there where you have the triple junction there's a lot of earthquake activity and the lighthouse structure out there is compromised as well. I see some folks asking questions on the chat um, and we'll try and address that um, at the end. So hold on to your questions. We have plenty of time. Sometimes my, there we go. 
So Cape Mendocino not only had a, a lighthouse at Cape Mendocino, but also a light ship off Blunt's Reef. There was so much, there's so many shipwrecks in that area. So there was a lot of, um, there was a rescue actually with one particular famous um, boat where a lot of them actually had to swim to the lighthouse ship to be rescued. After the 1906 earthquake and the health of all those poor lighthouse keepers that were living in the fuel house, um, they finally built a new 1908 dwelling um, that you see there. Many of the dwellings all looked very, very Victorian and were in good shape. Um, so here's a little bit of um, Archibald marble that I talked about. Um, when doing this book, I found incredible stories about the lighthouse keepers that lived there. And he was um, an infamous lighthouse keeper of our, of our region. So Cape Mendocino and Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse. Um, the light, you can you used to be able to see at the Humboldt County Fair for many years. As you walked in the fairgrounds, you'd see these, especially at night, these beautiful um, kind of shadows of light from our Cape Mendocino light. Um, the Coast Guard had uh, the city of Ferndale put that in storage and it hasn't been out since until they find proper storage. And there's a whole big thing about that that I won't get into, but um, they're no longer allowed to have the light and for the Humboldt County Fair entrance anymore. So the 1960s sees a lot of our poor lighthouse dwellings uh, burned. Um, <coughs> so John, you might want to put yourself on mute. I am muted. Oh, <laughs> well, we can hear you out here. <laughs> um, so I tell you, um, when I made you a host, I lost my ability to mute people. So if oh, you okay. want to go ahead and make me the host, Dan, I can take care of that. Okay, <laughs> so all right, I, I got it. Thanks. Um, 2000, they moved the Mendocino Lighthouse to Shelter Cove, and you can see that it's Malcolm's Park down in Shelter Cove, and it was completely redone by the community, and it looks wonderful. So you can see that today as well. And now um, you have the Trinidad Lighthouse that I was at today. Um, if you have never been to that, um, let me see, backspace. It's a beautiful lighthouse to visit. Um, and we just celebrated, like I said, the 150th anniversary of the Trinidad Lighthouse. Every first Saturday of the month, if you haven't been there, you, it will be open from 10 to noon. There was a beautiful Victorian there as well. And um, with the water tower, so they had problems with water for many years. And the oldest fog bell house on the cliffs there that the Coast Guard still manages. The light is no longer there. It's managed by the, the light you can see at the Trinidad Museum Society in Trinidad. And of course, the beautiful Victorian was torn down in 1960 and replaced by Coast Guard barracks. And then those have since been removed as well. Uh, Fred Harrington was the longest lighthouse keeper there in Trinidad from, for 28 years, and he actually died there, so raised his family and even his grandchildren. And I play uh, Josephine Harrington on some of those special occasions like today, um, where I tell the story of the 200-foot wave that Fred saw in 1914 on December 31st um, that actually put the light out. Uh, it was a rogue wave and took out the light. So the Coast Guard dwellings look like this, uh, the barracks, and they were there for about 40 years and torn down in 2000. And like I said, um, this is what it looks like today. So you can go every first Saturday of the month and the Trinidad Museum Society will open up um, the lighthouse. Otherwise it's closed that whole, you know, it's locked the gate, but you can go visit from 10 to noon. 
So the land beneath our feet is so rich, especially on our public lands. That's exactly why I did this book and why I'm doing the slideshow. Um, so here's a photo of uh, myself and our Peg Wheeler with her husband, Keith, um, doing a reenactment at the Trinidad Lighthouse. So we have wonderful, talented people like Peg, who is actually going to do more of an in-depth story soon. And it's going to be featured in the Humboldt Historian on Sarah Johnson. So she has really helped me a lot um, with that aspect of the Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse and that history out there. Our community is so special in that um, I can write these books and it's so supported locally as well as the slideshow. So I really appreciate that. Um, something really interesting about the, um, the Spanish, I was uh, talking about the Spanish coming to Trinidad earlier in 1775 when they came and erected this cross, it was a wooden cross. Um, there was a study done in 2015 and the wood, you can still see remnants of the wood um, and documents, uh, primary documents were discovered belonging to the actual cross that was erected there in 1775 that you can see the remnants of at the Trinidad Museum Society. Um, and then in 1913, they erected this granite cross in memoration of the Spanish that came in 1775. Okay, so a little bit about Punta Gorda Lighthouse. So, um, just like traffic accidents, you'll notice them. Um, a lot of funding happens around traffic accidents, especially when there's deaths. Um, it, that was sort of the way it went with our lighthouses as well. There was two big shipwrecks around Punta Borda that many people drowned in the St. Paul in 1905 and um, the tricolor as well. And so Punta Gorda was funded as a light station from 1912 to 1951. It was in operation. The lighthouse keeper was, um, his last name was Hunt Pascal Hunter. So he was also a lighthouse keeper. Now, many of these men, um, including uh, Fred Harrington and uh, the early lighthouse keepers, they were actually uh, Civil War veterans. Um, Fred Harrington actually worked in New Mexico um, during the Civil War, and um, as well as Pascal Hunter. So they were military men, so they're used to keeping a time schedule and taking their job very seriously and not having to worry about working as hard as they could. So lighthouse keeping was very difficult. They had these uh, Fresnel lenses that they had to take care of, polish all the brass, um, make sure the wick, wick was cleaned and trimmed every day. And then they had assistants as well. And then you had these beautiful Victorian uh, houses just along the coast there in the wilderness, basically. I mean, th that's the King Range National Conservation Area today. And you would have to go 11 miles from the town of Petrolia. So that was their nearest place the nearest store um, where they would get all their major supplies. So that was a, uh, a quite a isolated place. There are many artists at the Punta Gorda Lighthouse. And this is the fog signal station where they had a lot of brass that they polished and they took much pride in. The oil house is right behind there. So that's actually still there. And many of the people that were lighthouse keepers and assistants, like I said, were artists and they had art gallery inside of the fog signal station for many years and you could go visit. And um, a lot of community members found joy in visiting these lighthouses and found joy going and seeing art in the fog signal house and probably would stay the night or stay a while because it was so far and isolated. And then the 1960s come, um, just after World War II, they uh, put a sound buoy out in the ocean and it displaced the lighthouse. So it was no longer an operation. Everything really became moderate, um, automated by the 1950s and the need for lighthouse keepers were no more. 
And so they left the houses and it became kind of a ghost town. And they sat for many, many years until the 1960s. Um, the BLM actually, unfortunately, had to burn these buildings because they were falling apart and people were trying to live in them by 1970s. So 1970, they burned all the lighthouse keepers' homes. And so what we have now is the Punta Gorda Lighthouse, which we actually were able to get some funding. And um, by next year, um, it will be completely restructured. The foundation needed to be um, re-engineered. And uh, so interpretive signs and interpretive walks, possibly by me, um, will happen out there. Um, you can still go out there. It's an elephant seal colony, so you have to be careful of that. And um, it's a great place to visit our public lands. And if you want to know more about our public lands and how and the areas we manage, um, here's our website, the BLM Arcata Field Office, and that's just right off Giantoli. Um, there's my email and my work phone number. And I just wanted to especially thank the Trinidad Museum Society, the Humboldt County Historical Society, of course, for hosting this, as well as the many photos that I was able to use for the publication, as well as Humboldt State University photo collection um, I was able to use as well. So with that, we can go to questions. And that is the end of my slideshow. Okay, so looking at the questions, um, somebody wanted to know how much your book is that you're, um, you'll be at um, Book Letter tonight with. So it is $23.99. Okay. Um, <coughs> and um, somebody else also wanted to know where is Cape Disappointment? Um, it's near um, the mouth of the uh, Columbia River up near Portland. Okay. A lot of shipwrecks up there as well. It's the bar, uh, the Columbia bar is just uh, a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, um, there was uh, one comment. I seem to recall reading or hearing about one of the later keepers of Cape Mendocino who handcrafted bows from you wood. Does that sound familiar? Um, no, I haven't heard that one. I know that there's um, a man that actually lives near where Punta Gorda is along the coast and he makes fine art actually and staffs and things like that so I can't remember his name but um, he makes a lot of art for San Francisco he's a fine artist so that reminds me of him <laughs> um, and then another question um, when was the Swiftsure LV at Cape Mendocino when was that? So I was during the time of the layout keeping, so the early 1900s, I would say, but I can find that out for sure. Um, even though you write a book, you don't always remember offhand <laughs> your dates. A lot of info in there. Sorry to pull it up. Yeah. Um, that's no problem. There was many lighthouse ships there. Yeah, so it was placed on Blunt's Reef um, in 1906. Um, and the, uh, what was the source of your picture of San Francisco Bay that you showed at the beginning of the presentation? Um, so the houses and things like that, I just got it off the web. Um, so if you just Google San Francisco 1850, and you'll see a photo of it. So it was at Blunt's Reef from 1905 to 1930, the Swiss shore. Okay. Another question, is the Cape Mendocino Lighthouse site on public land or is it now private property? So it is public land, but um, I believe it's more of a like kind of an inholding. So you would have to cross private property to get to where it was. Um, there's nothing there now. Um, but if you wanted to see the um, rest restored tower, you can go to uh, Malcolm's Park in Shelter Cove. So there's really nothing there anyways. 
Um, okay, and if anybody has any other questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, while we are waiting, um, I will go ahead and plug the library. Um, well, first I wanna thank you, Julie, for doing this. This has been awesome. And I had no idea that the history was so, um, so diverse and all the women who were light housekeepers. That's so cool. Um, so I wanna thank everybody um, for joining us today. Um, if you're out at Arts Live, go see Julia Booklegger, buy a copy of her book, say you checked out the presentation. Um, we, um, if you're already signed up, if you're here, you're already signed up for our um, presentations for two, uh, 2022. Um, our next one, usually it's on the first Saturday of the month. Unfortunately, the first Saturday of January is January 1st and the library is closed. So um, join us next month. It'll be on the second um, Saturday, so January 8th. And I will go ahead and send out an email to everybody just reminding them so you're not logging in on New Year's Day wondering where we are. Um, and other than that, that's all I've got. So I just want to thank everybody. Thank Julie again for all this great presentation. Um, again, we record this, so it'll be up on YouTube probably by Tuesday. Um, so uh, check out our YouTube page. We've got all of our past lectures there. And um, other than that, if you have any questions or anything like that, you have my email. Please feel free to email me. It looks like anyway. Norbert has his hand up. Did, oh, did Norbert, you, did you have a question? question? Uh, good afternoon. First of all, Ms. Clark, thank you for your work uh, and working up the book. Uh, there were actually four light ships off Cape Mendocino at Blunt's Reef. The one that you referred to as the Swift Chewer was known as Blunt's light ship between 1905 and 1930. It was replaced in 1930 by the old San Francisco Bar light ship. That in turn was replaced in 1960 by the old Overfalls light ship. And then as Humboldt County deserved and as Cape Mendocino deserved, in 1969, the beautiful Blunts II light ship, a very modern vessel came to off Blunts Reef um, and stayed there for two years. So uh, I don't know whether your book addresses those other light ships, but in the second edition of your book, you might want to have a look at that. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to share um, is, as you undoubtedly know, the U.S. Coast Survey and U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey has fabulous short descriptions of the lighthouses, and there's actually a great history to why the Humboldt Bay Entrance Lighthouse was sited where it was. It had to do with competition against uh, Booner and Broderson, the two harbor pilots who worked for the mills and also for Pacific Mail Steamship Company. Um, and Booner and Broderson at Red Bluff actually installed their own lights as part of their range to bring vessels in or take them out. Um, uh, you'll get a chance to read about that because I'm writing on that subject, but you might want to look if you haven't already at the uh, various coast pilots and the directories from the 1850s and 1860s, because for mariners, sailors like myself, um, What's really important about the lighthouses, in addition to the great women that were lighthouse keepers and some of the guys, um, is that they really played a vital function in putting Humboldt Bay on the map for captains of sailing ships and steamships. And what is important about lighthouses, when you look at them from the, the ocean rather than from the land, is the distance at which you can see the light and the angles at which you can see the light. And just one comment, the Humboldt Bay entrance light was remarkable because it was one of the relatively few lights on the coast of California in the 1850s and 60s that had a 360 degree radius. You could see it from everywhere. So I greatly appreciate your work. Look forward to buying your book and um, look forward to your second edition. Yeah, yeah thanks. thanks.
All right. Well, if there's no there's other no comments, other comments. Oh, Barbara, if you could mute yourself, we're going to do a little feedback loop here. <laughs> I'm trying to just. There we go. Um, yeah, so if there's no other comments, we can go ahead and let you go. Um, thank you again for joining us. I hope everybody has a safe and wonderful end of the year and, and holidays. And um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at the library. And we'll see you again on, in January 2022. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And Julie, you have all the controls, so you're the one who actually gets to end the meeting. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>